So I think I need you to transfer to me. And, and we are recording. Excellent. Okay, so let me share my screen. It's like one up by one. All right, so uh, it is just an absolute delight to be with you today and to share this story. My name, as, as you heard, is Carol Simon Levin, but I take on other personas, and today I'm going to become Emily Warren Roebling, who you see here, and I will be uh, telling her story. So I'm just, there we go. So, let us begin. As I said, today I'm going to be telling you the story of a bridge builder in petticoats, Emily Warren Roebling. Before I begin to tell my story, I just want to bring your attention to a plaque that if you've ever walked or bicycled across the Brooklyn Bridge, you might have noticed. Uh, on this plaque are three names my own, Emily Warren Roebling, that of my husband, Colonel Washington Roebling, and finally that of my father-in-law, John A. Roebling. And after our time together, I hope that you will understand why all three of our names appear on this plaque. So let me introduce myself. As I said, my name is Emily Warren Roebling, but I was born Emily Warren. 177 years ago. And when I was born, I never could have, have ever imagined I would become a bridge builder because women didn't do that. Most women, in fact, didn't work. Well, women of my class, poor women, of course, worked in fields and factories and as domestic servants. But a woman of, of a comfortable means, we knew our role in life was to be a wife or a mother. But things do have a bit of uh, uh, changes happen. And uh, in fact, there were changes in the air as early as when, when I was five years old, when the Seneca Falls Convention happened just uh, about 100 miles north of my home in Cold Spring, New York. And at that convention, uh, um, pardon me for one second. I think we've got a problem here because we didn't make this co-sharing co and we've got a lot of people popping in. Um, I think maybe, do we? is there any way to make us both hosts here? Okay. Um, Let me see. Uh, no, uh, let's see. If I make you host, uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, but I keep up the screen. Sure. Let me see if I can still do this. This is still working, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, okay, what I might just do is, because I kept losing my train of thought as a new person uh, popped in, yeah. I might just start over if it's all right with you. Start Fine. at the first screen one more time. Um, the other thing is that a panel kept popping up on my, covering my screen. So let's try this again. Do you see me as well or just okay, the I, screen? I, I just see the screen right now because I did. That's what I... That's what I'm seeing too. For some reason, I've lost my image. So let's see. This is odd. Here we go. Okay, now I've got both me and it. Do you have me side by side with the screen? Oh, uh, let me move that. Up. As a participant, I can see her and the screen. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. And am I staying there, or when the library talks, do, do I disappear? Yeah. Am I, when yeah. Jan so, we need talks, pin, so we need to pin me. Let's see if we can, if you're able to uh, get to, back to my image and there should be a pin there, Jan, to pin me right on. And that should keep me there. Okay. And then I should be here. Otherwise, if, if you're muted, I'll stay here. Um, uh, I'll stay consistently there. Okay. Okay. All right. Just... So let's try this one more time. Um, apologies, everybody. We have such excitement in, in the virtual universe. 
But this this should be better. At this point, I think I should be side by side with my screen and you should see me. Is that correct, Jan? Yep. Yes, okay. correct. Excellent. All right. Thanks so much. Then I will get started one more time. So as I said, today I am portraying Emily Warren Roebling, Bridge Builder in Petticoats. My name is Carol Simon Levin, and I'm absolutely delighted to be with you. So uh, if you ever crossed the Brooklyn Bridge by foot or by bicycle, you may have seen a sign. And on this sign, there are three names with the last name of a, a Roebling. Me, uh, my name, Emily Warren, my husband, Colonel Washington A. Roebling, and my father-in-law, John A. Roebling. And after our time together, I hope you will understand why we three shared this plaque. But my story, of course, doesn't begin with a bridge. Indeed, my story begins 177 years ago when I was born in Cold Spring, New York. And when I was born, I could never have imagined I would become a bridge builder. Women didn't have those sorts of dreams. Women, uh, for the most part, well, poor women worked in fields and factories and as domestic servants. But women of, of comfortable means, as I was, we knew as girls that our role in life was to become a wife and a mother, make a good marriage and have good children. There were some stirrings of change in the air. When I was just five years old, the Seneca Falls Convention was held uh, just a hundred or so miles north of my town. And the women and some men there demanded more rights for women, uh, many rights, most controversially, the right to vote, but that right would not be achieved in my lifetime. I grew up, uh, I was one of 12 children, six of whom lived to adulthood, which sadly was pretty typical in my time. Uh, I had, however, loved uh, teasing my brothers and sisters. I loved horsing around inside and outside. I liked riding, side saddle, of course. Uh, I also liked playing practical jokes on my siblings. And my favorite uh, sibling was my, the oldest living brother, Governor, Governor Kimball, who was um, 13 years older than I was. And so when I was five, he went off to West Point to study engineering. And then after graduation, he entered the Army Corps of Engineering. He surveyed the Mississippi River. He followed the Lewis and Clark expedition out to the uh, West where he uh, wrote wonderful, exciting letters about his time in Indian country. And I just wanted to do the same. But of course, as a girl, I could not. However, he did give me the best gift he could have. After our father's death, he paid for me to enroll in the Georgetown Convent School in Washington, D.C., which despite its name was very progressive. It thought that women, girls, could learn things that most people thought our brains were not capable of. So in addition to a more conventional curriculum of history and housekeeping, geography and embroidery, painting, mythology, French, piano, composition, and so forth, they also taught us algebra, geometry, bookkeeping, astronomy, botany, meteorology, chemistry, and geology, maths and sciences that I found so exciting, although but no one ever dreamed a girl would actually put them to use. Well, after graduation, I went back to uh, Cold Spring, and shortly after that, our country broke out in war, what we then called the war between the states, what you now call the Civil War. And my brother became an officer in the army. And you can see him right here in those bright red trousers, uh, very handsome indeed, in the front of this painting. And I am in this flowered hat in the back row. Well, my brother made quite a name for himself, particularly at Round Top in Little Round Top in Gettysburg, where he and his aide de camp, uh, a man by the name of Washington Roebling, who you will hear quite a bit of in a few minutes, noticed that the that mount, that high point was not very well defended, and they brought in men and cannon to uh, to defend that spot. And some people consider that what he did then actually gave us um, 
led to our victory there, to the Union victory there, that we might not have succeeded without that foresight. Well, as I mentioned, his his aide-de-camp was Washington A. Roebling, and he was also, Washington was also a uh, an engineer. In this case, he was a suspension bridge engineer, the son of, of a suspension bridge builder. He became an aide de camp to my brother. He also built, uh, designed and built two bridges during the during the Civil War, and he went up in a tethered hot air balloon to do uh, reconnaissance, aerial reconnaissance for the war. Well, I met Washington, or Washi as I soon would call him, in February 1864 when there was a grand ball. My brother invited me to attend, and apparently Washi was immediately smitten because that night he wrote a letter home to his sister, describing me as, she is dark brown eyed, slightly pug nosed, lovely mouth and teeth, and a most entertaining talker, which is a good thing you know, I myself being so stupid. <laughs> Well, uh, we, that began a relationship that soon got, um, well, you would call, call rather warm indeed. Um, indeed, I felt that my letters, uh, which we wrote almost daily, uh, were, were too lovely, dovey, too forward. So I was afraid they might fall into somebody else's hands and compromise my reputation, particularly after we were engaged about six weeks afterwards, after we began. And, and so I urged my uh, fiance to burn them and he assures me that he did. So we no longer have my letters, but we do have his, which were um, transcribed to TypeScript later on. And you can see, uh, you can see the uh, them at Rutgers if you ever want to go there. But you get a sense of Washington's mood and in fact the general mood of the war at the in, uh, in 1864 from some of these letters. I have had the pleasure within the past few days to be struck by lightning and to fall into a well, both of which accidents passed off without any particular damage to your devoted admirer. On another mm -hmm. occasion he writes, the papers must have told you that we have been fighting a little. Our corps has only 12,000 left out of 27,000. Uncle Robert Lee isn't licked yet by a long shot. And if we are not mighty careful, he will beat us yet. And on another occasion, they must put fresh steam on the man factories up north. The demand down here for killing purposes is far ahead of the supply. Thank God, however, for this consolation that when the last man is killed, the war will be over. Well, the war was eventually over, and even before that, my husband, or sorry, my fiance, soon to be husband, was uh, left with an honorable discharge at the end of 1864, and we were married three weeks later in uh, Cold Spring on January 18th, and you can see these are our marriage pictures. Well, as I indicated before, my uh, father-in-law was a very famous build bridge builder, and he had plans for his son, and those included that his son should go off to Cincinnati to supervise the completion of a suspension bridge that his father had been building there. And uh, the plan was that I would not go along. Uh, my father-in-law's wife had never gone along on these adventures, but I, well, I ask you, how would you feel if you had a situation like that where you were newly wed and told you might be uh, apart for a year or two right after that. You can imagine I was not pleased. So even though my husband did go off to Cincinnati, uh, I started lobbying from uh, very, very quickly to go along. And he, he, he wrote uh, back words of discouragement, really, um, because Cincinnati was so filthy. It was uh, the smoke from all the coal. He said, everything here is black, black. No one wears anything else. It is of no use. No amount of washing keeps the hands clean. Your gray checked silk would be black in a week. But this uh, did not keep me from wanting to join my husband there. And he finally made arrangements for housing for both of us and transportation for me. And he wrote, if I have someone to talk to like yourself, it will take off half the load, even if you don't know much about it. So I would love you to take a look for a minute at these pictures of that bridge, and I imagine that you will agree with me that they look a little bit like another bridge that you're all familiar with. People tend to call this the uh, practice suspension bridge, the practice uh, 
Brooklyn Bridge because many of the techniques that uh, my father-in-law, John A. Roebling, would put into the design of the bridge uh, between Manhattan and Brooklyn were first uh, enacted on this bridge right here. I also um, draw your attention to a couple of these pictures here. One is Suspension Bridge, Cincinnati O. It was so exciting, somebody wrote a song about it. And the other uh, is this mural that was just put up a little over a decade ago now, uh, which shows the bridge with a blue sky. And I can assure you that no one, uh, no one there saw a sky like that when I was there. It was much closer to the photograph you see at the bottom where it was always gray. I'm hearing a bit of a hiss. I don't know if somebody may be not muted and needs to mute. In any event, uh, after two years there, we returned to, uh, to the East Coast, to New Jersey, which is where my husband's family was living at the time, his father's family. And uh, there we discovered that his father was hard at work at a new project. And that was a bridge over the river uh, uh, the East River in in New York, and that bridge, uh, that that project had long been in the making. People had been wanting a bridge or, or dreaming about a bridge for for over a century. Uh, the, the there was lots and lots of traffic between. Uh, Brooklyn and New York, but all of that traffic was by boats, by ferries, uh, and that those, those ferries crossed all year, all, all day, every day, many times a day, um, all year long, and some of those crossings were quite perilous, including one that my um, husband, who was then a teenager, had had with his father in 1853 when ice choked the river, and uh, they actually had to climb on some of that ice to get back to the pier. Uh, so by the 1860s, fer the ferries were making approximately a thousand crossings every day in all weathers, in all conditions, and people were eager for an alternative. So there was a lot of excitement about an East River Bridge, but there was also a there were a lot of problems involved, which is the reason that one hadn't been built. First of all, the East River was a major shipping lane, so uh, any bridge would have to be built quite high so that the tall ships could get underneath. It was also very wide, uh, almost a while, uh, uh, nearly a mile wide. And um, there were no cliffs, so there was nothing to hang the bridge from. You would have to build towers in the river to hold it up. And so, uh, but, uh, it was uh it, it also looked like anything that they did would be quite quite expensive and in fact the price tag on the bridge that my father-in-law designed was five to seven million dollars which was more than anybody had ever paid for a bridge in in at that time probably about 200 million today so why did they accept my father-in-law's proposal because John A. Roebling had already established quite a reputation for himself by this time. He'd been born in 1806 in Germany, studied engineering there, and then found that nobody wanted a young engineer to do anything really important. And being an ambitious young man, he decided to do what many did. He went west. He went all the way west from Germany to America, to Pennsylvania, western Pennsylvania. And he... Um, then took a job, he, he started with a farm there, but very soon discovered farming wasn't for him. He took a job on the new canals and saw an accident where uh, a canal boat that was being uh, pulled up a, a, a railway by hemp rope, the rope broke and, um, and the people uh, at the low end uh, were hurt. And so he thought, I've been reading in my journals about people spinning rope out of wire. Let me see if I can do this. He did. He started wire, a wire rope factory in his farmyard, and eventually he um, opened America's first wire rope factory in Trenton, New Jersey, after he found that the reason that uh, the land had been so cheap in western Pennsylvania were that there were no transportation options for his, his wire rope. Uh, so all of this is happening in the 1840s, but that's not the only pot he has in the fire. He still loves these suspension bridges of his. So he keeps entering competitions to 
contest to build them, and he wins a contest in 1845 to design a um, suspension aqueduct over the Allegheny River in Pittsburgh. Well, this leads to a number of other commissions, including his most famous in 1855. He uh, gets he builds the world's first working suspension railway bridge over the Niagara. And um, it makes him famous. It's double decker, as you can see here. And, uh, we need uh, Mama. Can you put your mute on? guys? Where do we have or Janet? Can you mute everybody except me? Thank you. Um, great. So, in as I said, in 1855, he. Uh, builds this uh, suspension, uh, double-decker suspension railway bridge, and it makes him famous. And by 1867, he's built five aqueducts and four of the longest and most beautiful suspension bridges in America. And not only are they thrilling, but uniquely they are safe. At a time when one out of four bridges falls down, all of his have stayed up. So he's regarded as an ex extremely talented bridge builder. He's also um, apparently a really difficult person. My husband will write, it was a fortunate thing that he, his, his father's engineering engagements, kept him away for prolonged periods, otherwise his children would all have died young. In any event, we come back, we uh, meet with my father-in-law after returning to Trenton, and we um, we see that he is designing this beautiful, beautiful bridge. And you can see the designs right here. He writes on the designs, the completed structure will not only be the greatest bridge in existence, but will be the greatest engineering work of this continent and of the age. Well, that um, sounds like it's bragging, but it turns out that's pretty much what it is. And he's given free reign to design anything he wants. But he has a big practical problem, which I've already told you about, and that is that he's going to have to put towers into the river. And in order to put a tower into a river, you have to keep the water out while you're going down to a solid riverbed, uh, rock bed. And so when we arrive, he tells us, um, he, he invites us into a study and he says, son and daughter-in-law, you never had a honeymoon. I'm sure you would like a honeymoon. I'm sure you would love to honeymoon in uh, Europe. I will pay for a honeymoon in Europe. And by the way, son, I need you to do some research on these things called pneumatic caissons that they're building there. Well, that was an offer we couldn't refuse. We set sail for Europe. My husband sent back schematic drawings of the caissons he researched. And a year later, I bring back a uh, son, John A. Roebling II. We knew which side our bread was buttered. When we return, my husband and his father start what they call politicking because anybody who is anybody has to approve of this bridge. They take people around, uh, engineers, politicians, and so forth, around to the other projects. This is um, a photograph that was taken on the uh, Niagara Bridge. And uh, finally, however, it does get all the approvals. It needs approvals from both Manhattan and from uh, Brooklyn. It needs New York State and it needs approvals from the Department of War in Washington, D.C. because the uh, East River is considered militarily strategic. But finally, on June 25th, 1869, we get that last uh, approval. Three days later, disaster. My father-in-law, who had and, and my and my husband had been sighting the location of the towers when a barge hit the pier and crushed my father-in-law's toes and he he became unconscious they amputated his toes but he refused any further doctoring all he would allow was cold water to be poured on the injured foot and tetanus set in and so uh, a little less than a month later after well, an excruciating death, my husband found himself in charge of this mammoth project, which my husband was 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 terrified about. He he wrote, "Here I was." He later wrote, "Here I was at the age of 32, suddenly put in charge of the most stupendous engineering structure of the age. At first, I thought I would succumb, but I had a strong tower to lean upon. My wife." a woman of infinite tact and wisest counsel. Now, neither of us had any idea how he would come to need my help 
What we did know was this bridge was not yet begun. There had not yet even been a shovelful of dirt turned. So the first thing that had to be done was a lot of digging. What was done was that a, the, a caisson, which I give you just to give you an idea of what a caisson is, it's a pneumatic caisson. Imagine a box, a shoe box, throw away the uh, the top and then turn it upside down and put it uh, on the what uh, sink it into the riverbed. That's what the caisson was like, except that in this case it was made out of wood with an iron edge footing around the base and um, it was about half the size of a football field. But anyway, these were built on land and then towed into the river, sunk. The water was pumped out and uh, pressurized air pumped in to, to retain, to keep the water out. And then men were sent down shift after shift after shift to dig out this river bed. It was horrific work. Um, this was uh, hot, smelly. This is a time when the, the river had been used as a garbage dump for New York for over 300 years. It, 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 brutal, brutal conditions. Um, in fact, one of our assistant engineers, E.F. Frank uh, Farrington, uh, he, in an interview with, uh, with a magazine, with uh, Scientific American, he compared conditions to Dante's Inferno. But a hundred men would be descending at a time, and you can see in the schematic, they'd go down below. There were uh, chambers. They would break up the, um, the riverbed with, uh, with shovels and picks and occasional uh, dynamite, but that's all they had. They didn't have power tools down there. And they would be breaking it up, and then they would send it up through these kind of, if you've ever been at a fair and gotten a claw that you could you know, put in some money and try to get your prize, they're doing that with these claws to take up the debris and out and over. And it was, it was terrible work. A third of our workers uh, quit every week. But this is a time of the famine in, in Ireland, so there were always more coming in. In addition to all of the terrible uh, conditions down there, it was also very dangerous. We did not have electric lights, so there was open flames, and this is, as I said, a wooden caisson, so it was uh, there was always a worry of a fire. And on December 1st, 1870, there was a fire in the Brooklyn Chamber. My husband and others went down and fought it. When he emerged, about 20 hours later, he and a number of the other men collapsed. And this was a sign of things that were gonna come because we started seeing something that we called caisson disease. Men who'd go down perfectly healthy into the chambers and come back up doubled over in pain. And as our caissons went deeper, more and more of our men were, uh, were getting these symptoms. And in the early spring of 1872, my husband came back up one day and completely collapsed. And the doctor said he didn't think that he would survive. Well, he did survive, but he was very, very much weakened, and he was unable to leave our home for quite some time, but he didn't want to give up the project, and so he did something quite extraordinary. He asked me, as his wife, to go to the head uh, the, of the bridge engineering company and argue that for my husband to remain chief engineer. And so I did go to the boardroom. I was probably the first woman ever to set foot in there, except perhaps for a charwoman. And I argued for my husband, who had pointed out in a letter, one mind can in a few hours think up enough work to keep a thousand men employed for many years. And um, the, the president of the bridge company agreed that I could be my husband's voice briefly, temporarily, until things settled down. We never imagined that temporarily, that briefly, would last for over 10 years. But instead of getting better, my husband got weaker and weaker, and he either couldn't or wouldn't write or read, 
uh, or talk to anybody else except for me. And so I became his eyes, ears, hands, feet, and voice on the project. I took care of all the correspondence between the assistant engineers and my husband. I conveyed his instructions to them, their concerns to him. And in order to understand what I was doing, I started learning both from my husband and from his textbooks, higher mathematics, strength and material stress analysis, and other details needed in suspension bridge construction. Some people say I was the first civil engineer. Others say I was only a manager on the project. I certainly did not have a formal engineering education, but neither did most engineers working on, on projects. They were lay trained on the projects themselves, which is possibly why those 19 out of 20, um, sorry, 19 out of 20 uh, engineers working on projects had no education, which is probably why one out of four bridges fall, fell down. In any event, under these circumstances, construction continued and uh, the foundations uh, were built. Uh, the caissons eventually were put on solid ground and filled in, and then towers were erected on them as well. It, the whole thing took another three years. And so we get to 1876, which is the centennial of the country. And in Philadelphia, there's a massive exhibition, but in, and they have a model of the bridge there. But in New York, everybody's watching the real thing going up. And on August 25th of that year, we strung the very first cable between the two towers. And our uh, master mechanic, E.G. Frank Farrington, he took a 22 minute ride on this little chair. It's uh, a boatswain's, a bosun's chair, but it um, looks a lot like a child's swing. Anyway, it took 22 minutes for him to, to cross on that chair. And everybody apparently was looking, including the New York Times, which wrote about church bells ringing, factory whistles screaming, cannon roared, and the myriads of spectators swung their hats and cheered with wild excitement. They called it a perfect pandemonium. Well, that led to a total of 23,000 trips using this machine that had been designed by my father-in-law to spin wire into four great cables that would cross, uh, consist of over 35,000 uh, miles and, and make four great uh, cables to hold up the bridge. It took over two years. You see the gentleman in this top hat here. I don't know if he's a spectator, a supervising engineer, uh, or a member of the public because in, oops, in there we go. In 1876, the uh, the bridge company, sorry, 1877, the bridge company decided to sell tickets. You could get a, a, have a chance to walk on the temporary footbridges that were being strung to help build the bridge. And if you bought a ticket to what was called the Pathway to the Sky, and you had a very strong stomach, you could cross on this bridge that was made up of slats where you could look down over 250 feet to the water below, and all you had to hold on to was this flimsy rope uh, banister sort of thing. And the illustrated papers had a field day with this. Uh, you can see this gentleman holding up this uh, lady who's dropped her parasol and apparently fainted. But I'm also amused by the gentleman before and aft uh, of this lady, of this pair, who are crawling on all fours or even all sixes to get across the bridge. So you needed quite an iron constitution to do it. But uh, if you did go on it and you wanted to show how how much courage it took, you might buy a stereograph, a uh, three-dimensional uh, photograph that you could show to your friends, or if you didn't want to even go up there, you could get the experience virtually that way. It was quite popular, but they only kept it open for that one summer. Meanwhile, that same summer, we moved to Columbia Heights, Brooklyn, to a house that the back overlooked the bridge. And for the first time in, in about in over three years, my husband was able to see the progress of the bridge with his own eyes again. We had uh, lived in various places, including Trenton, New Jersey, during this time. But he still felt too ill, or said he felt too ill, to meet with engineers, trustees, contractors, suppliers, any of those things. 
And so he kept using me as his go-between, but we did, we kept it quiet. We did not let the public know about this. And it would only be after the bridge opened and had proved itself um, safe that, uh, that the New York Times would, would report on this, saying uh, that uh, part of my role, this necessitated new pa patterns and representatives of the mills de desiring the bid went to New York to consult with Mr. Roebling. Their surprise was great when Mrs. Roebling sat down with them and by her knowledge of engineering, helped them out with their patterns and cleared away difficulties that had for weeks been puzzling their brains. You have to love uh, newspaper reporters. But in any event, some of the correspondence in the files is addressed directly to me as Mrs. Roebling. But all was not, uh, all was not wonderful. Lots of, there were lots of stresses and setbacks going on during this time, uh, primarily having to do with money and safety and corruption. This is a time of Tammany Hall in New York. Uh, corrupt contractors are everywhere. There, uh, we had issues with labor, uh, safety, and pay. There was a lot of political infighting. There was financial shenanigans of all sorts. And worst of all, there was ever-present danger. And in June of 1878, we had a very public disaster when a, uh, a wire line broke. It flew off. It beheaded two of our uh, workers that then flew down into the water, nearly capsized a, a ferry. So the newspapers wrote all about that. And then, uh, little, just about a year and a half later, a brand new beautiful bridge in Scotland, the Tay Bridge, collapsed with a fully loaded passenger train on board with tremendous loss of light, life. And the um, local papers here screamed, will the Tay disaster be repeated between New York and Brooklyn. There were rumors about nobody had seen my husband. They said uh, he was paralyzed, his mind had gone, maybe he was dead. Uh, nobody had seen him, as I said, for, for years. So we knew we needed to restore public uh, confidence. And so we sent E.G. Frank Farrington out on another errand, this time not on a little child swing, but carrying or alongside a a uh, lantern slideshow uh, projector that talked about the bridge. He gave a lecture and uh, he emphasized the design and safety of the bridge that no bridge designed by John A. Roebling had ever fallen down. Uh, there was of course no mention of my role that would not have helped our cause in any way, but the New York Star wrote this one inch of text, which I proudly uh, glued into the scrapbook, which I kept all the, the clippings about the bridge. And it said, it is whispered among the knowing ones over the river that Mr. F's manuscript is in the handwriting of a clever lady whose style and calligraphy are already familiar in the office of the Brooklyn Bridge. We also brought in the big guns, uh, including Ferdinand de Lesseps, who had recently completed the Suez Canal, who toured the bridge and pronounced it uh, good. And then a week later, I accompanied him to a dinner of the American Society of Civil Engineers, where he spoke enthusiastically about the project. Well, in December of 1881, the skeleton of the bridge was complete. All that was left to add was the roadbed, and it was felt a good time to show off the bridge to interested parties, to politicians, to newspaper reporters, trustees, and so forth. And uh, we went there. I led a delegation of these trustees and, and other gentlemen across the bridge, and the newspapers wrote about how the wind was blowing and seagulls were swooping as we walked across this five foot wide wooden walkway. And when we arrived at the New York Tower, 1600 feet away, everyone was drinking champagne and giving a toast to Mrs. Roebling and the success of things in general, which shows that really what this was all about was for the newspaper publicity because the trustees had just come that very morning from a meeting in which they were trying, some of them were trying to oust my husband as chief engineer. Many of them had never seen me, seen him. There were a lot of um, political disagreements on this bridge. And uh, I had to get, my husband asked me and I, I had to get to work and I, uh, started visiting all of the trustees individually. I spoke at the American Society of Civil Engineers, first woman ever to do that, and talked to newspaper reporters and so forth. And finally, when the vote was taken in August of 1882, 
it, they voted t uh, 10 to 7, the, the trustees, to retain my husband. And my husband was appreciative. He said that I was invaluable, especially as a peacemaker, and that I was well-liked by just about everyone, even those who disagreed or wished to oust her husband. That same year, I was acknowledged in public for the first time when an engineer at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where my husband had gone to school, uh, spoke and said, gentlemen, I know that the name of a woman should not be lightly spoken in public, but I believe you will acquit me any lack of delicacy or reverence when I utter the name Mrs. Washington Roebling. She's a woman of unusual executive ability, with firm and decided with opinions on almost every subject. Well, uh, 14 years had gone by, by 1883. Um, after 14 years, we were finally nearing completion. And uh, during that time, Alexander Graham Bell had invented the telephone and Thomas Edison the electric light, both of which technologies would have been ever so helpful, and neither of which we had to build the bridge. But at this point, as the uh, these workers right here were tying the last stays together on the bridge. It was found, it was deemed a good time to test the bridge before the grand opening. And so just uh, a few days before the official grand opening, I was driven across the bridge. We don't have an image of this, but if you look at the vehicle on the right, that was very similar to the one that I rode. And I carried a live rooster, and you're probably looking at me and saying, Mrs. Roebling, a live rooster, what? Well, I was carrying a live rooster because uh, the rooster was the ancient Greek uh, symbol of, of, of auspicious beginnings. It was for good luck. And it was said that every workman along the route cheered and raised his hat in a salute, which was very, very gratifying, particularly because I wasn't royalty, I wasn't an elected official. As I said, women wouldn't even have the vote for another 37 years, and I would by that time no longer be on this earth. But I was being honored in the celebration of this great engineering marvel. On May 24th, 1883, we had the grand opening and everyone who was anybody was there, including President Chester Arthur, mayors, politicians, trustees, dignitaries, everyone but one. My husband watched the proceedings from our back window. But it was called the People's Day. Schools, businesses, they were all closed. People came by foot, carriage, stagecoach, boat, and train. Some people said that the river was so full of boats it was almost paved by boats. But the bridge company made absolutely no mention of me. Not surprising. However, one of the trustees did, which was, and that was Congressman Abraham, Abram S. Hewitt, who said, uh, it is an everlasting monument to the self-sacrificing devotion of woman and of her capacity for that higher education from which she's been too long debarred, which was very gratifying. After the opening ceremonies, uh, the dignitaries came back to our house, which was decorated with flags and buntings and flowers galore. And my absolute favorite, a spun sugar model of the bridge, three foot long, which sadly nobody took a photograph of, so you have to imagine it. But my husband stood up at that gathering and said, I want the world to know that you too are one of the builders of the bridge. That evening, newly installed electric lights blinked on in a gorgeous arc from New York to Britain. And then at 8 o'clock, the lights went off and magnificent fireworks uh, were shot off for over an hour. Uh, it was This was the first electrified icon in New York City. Uh, and the, uh, Thomas Edison had created his first electric station just a few months before. Well, all night long, people cheered, bands played, and the next day it was opened to traffic. And as we know that it is a foot, I mean a, a toll bridge, we know what that traffic was. The first day was only pedestrians and over 150,000 walkers uh, went across. But the next day it was open to real traffic and you could take a bridge train. It cost you uh, five cents and took you five minutes. You could take your own horse and buggy for 10 cents. You could bring your cow for a nickel. A sheep or a pig cost you two cents each and walkers paid a penny. But tragically, tragically, too many people paid a penny just 
or less than a week later. It was on uh, Decoration Day, what you now call Memorial Day. And it was estimated that 100,000 people were on the bridge when something happened. Maybe somebody shouted, the sky is falling, who knows? But people panicked and they headed for the exits. And this is how, when we discovered the real problem with a, a small but major problem with the design, pedestrian access was by way of spiral staircases, which are fine if people are walking, but if people are shoving, they are deadly. And 12 people died in the melee, even more were injured. Which leads us to the financial and human cost of the bridge, because it it was expensive both in lives and in money. Two and it took two and a half times as long as my father-in-law had predicted, and about that much in cost. It ended up costing over fifteen million dollars, and in lives, at least twenty-seven men died. We don't have workers' compensation in those days, so there may have been even more, uh, and many others, like my husband, were injured. There was another cost as well, uh, unintended consequence. Do you see this beautiful, beautiful building under the bridge? That was the ferry building. There was one on either side, of course, of the river. And when you have a thousand crossings a day, that is a center of commerce. But once the bridge was built, it was literally overshadowed. And the commerce was drawn away from the wharves here, which soon fell into disrepair and disrepute and it would take nearly a century to bring them back. The bridge itself, however, was an enormous success. Tall, beautiful, this combination of solid stone and spidery steel wires caught the imagination. It was the first uh, bridge in the world to use steel cables, and it had the longest span of any bridge on Earth. It was um, it did what it was supposed to. It helped Brooklyn grow. It provided a safe, reliable alternative to the ferries, and it withstood the blizzard of 1888, wind being the, the enemy of, of bridges, suspension bridges. And for nearly 50 years after it was finished, it was considered the most magnificent suspension bridge ever built. It was sometimes called the eighth wonder of the world. It even withstood the weight of 21 bell elephants when P.T. Barnum took his circus parade across the bridge the following year. Uh, along with the elephants, there were camels and dromedaries, and the New York Times wrote, to people who looked up from the river at the big arch of electric lights, it seemed as if Noah's Ark were emptying itself over Long Island. And there are two children's books all about the elephants. As for uh, our family, after the bridge was completed, a month later, I wrote out my husband's letter of resignation. And uh, the family moved to Trenton so that my husband could be, be near the family business, the wire rope factory. And then, um, very mysteriously, my husband got better. His health improved, so much so that uh, the following, uh, a few years later, he helped, uh, he went to uh, to work on the Niagara Falls Suspension Bridge. Meantime, my son, who had been a toddler when the bridge began, was uh, grew up and went to college. He went and he followed his father's footsteps. He went to Rensselaer Polytechnic. And uh, I discovered, we discovered he had a heart, uh, heart problem. And so uh, I moved to the family there to be closer to him for a few years. And my husband went back and forth to Trenton. Once we relocated permanently in Trenton, I decided it was high time for me to get involved in another building project. I wanted a little house in Trenton. Well, not a little house, a magnificent mansion. We had the money. They, we hadn't earned a lot of money from the bridge. In fact, barely broken even with the cost. But, um, but the wire rope factory had made everyone in my husband's family quite wealthy. And I decided some of that money should be spent on, uh, on a house. And uh, I hired a George Edward Harney. If you've ever been to Newark Museum and seen the Ballantine House there, he designed that as well. And I was quite an active uh, employer of, of uh, Mr. Harney. I had, I had serious ideas of what I wanted, including um, a stained glass picture of the bridge right above our staircase and you can see I'm sta uh, standing 
uh, there below. There was a bowling alley in my house. There was electricity. Uh, I was the first private residence in Trenton to have electricity, and I said it made my house look like a fairyland. I loved it. I also, uh, we also had a, a, a carriage, of course, and I still loved my horses and liked to drive it on a fine day. Oops. Um, I also decided it was high time to get some traveling. And so in uh, 1892, I convinced my husband and we traveled uh, to Europe together. And then in 1896, when he didn't want to go back, uh, I went by myself, well, I went with uh, some women friends. And there we attended the um, coronation of the Tsar and Empress of Russia. And uh, I was presented to Queen Victoria and I wrote back, uh, home verily the world moves think of Queen Victoria shaking hands with Susan B Anthony and inviting her to take a cup of tea in Windsor Castle uh, in 1893 I along with some other women from New Jersey joined other women around the country to uh, have an exhibit in the women's building at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago and I uh, served on a number of committees there including one's uh, examining women's working and women's patents. And I was very gratified when a French duchess complimented my skill as an engineer recognized me. Um, in uh, the years that followed, in 1898, uh, my uh, we, the, my, our country again went to war. It was called the Spanish-American War, and my son followed his father's footsteps and volunteered to be an engineer for the army. He ended up not getting sent abroad, but the men who were, the soldiers who were, the troops came back, and they were quarantined in a horrible, horrible camp on Long Island, Camp Wyckoff. And we heard uh, they were quarantined there because of illness, but we heard the conditions were terrible. And so a delegation of women from New Jersey went up to investigate. We were denied admittance from the main gate by the train station. So we hired a carriage and went around the back and took a tour and discovered that conditions were even worse than reported. And so with years of project management experience, I went right to work. We hired cooks, we brought in food, supplies, blankets, clothes, women built platforms tents for the troops. Our nurses came in a full five days before the Red Cross. Turned out to be very dangerous work. One of our nurses died of the typhoid. But when the president, President McKinley, toured the camp, he said, "There's I have seen nothing here to praise except for the world, work of the women. And the New Jersey legislature passed a resolution uh, about our service, amending our service there. Uh, just after this, I ended up enrolling in a women's law course, a one semester law course at New York University. Now this was not a law course to become a lawyer. Uh, women were not yet becoming lawyers, but many women wanted to be able to argue articulately about the law because we were dealing with things like women's suffrage and other women's rights. And I thought this was a, a, a wonderful idea and really took to it, uh, even though I was having difficulties with my sight. And I was determined to complete my work and was so gratified when my essay was uh, given the prize and uh, was uh, chosen to be read at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, ser graduation ceremonies. And it was called, my essay was called A Wife's Disabilities, and I called for the elimination of laws discriminating against wives and widows, stating that under current law, the sacred right of marriage conferred upon her the honor of ranking and legal responsibility with idiots and slaves, and arguing that the statutes should be changed so that the property belongs equal to man and wife, does she not contribute largely to a success or failure? To, in life. And it, my essay was written up and I got a lot of newspaper coverage and so forth, which I loved. I wrote my son, a certain amount of flattery is as necessary to me as oxygen. But my husband wasn't pleased. And he told uh, my husband, he, he told the prof uh, professor, I never heard her essay until tonight. And I do not agree with one word she has said. I continued to take an interest in the bridge as well, uh, noting on several occasions in letters to my son about um, technical details about a new trolley electric system and um, some, some wear and tear on the bridge. And I don't have the letter that he wrote back to me, but this is my response to him. 
it, it must have been a, a bit of a caddy letter on his part because I wrote, I'm still feeling well enough and well enough to stoutly maintain against all critics, including my only son, that I have more brains, common sense, and know how generally than any two engineers, civil or uncivil, that I have ever met. And but for me, the Brooklyn Bridge would never have had the name Roebling in any way connected with it. Your father was for years dead to all interest in that work. Now, I don't know if that's totally true or whether I was just angry, but in any case, that's what I wrote him. In 1889, 1899 the Troy Daily News, the, uh, the Rensselaer Polytechnic Town newspaper, wrote an editorial suggesting that the bridge be named after uh, the Roebling family, pointing out that John A. Roebling was one of the greatest engineers, his son Washington, a worthy successor whose health was wrecked by disease contracted during his labors in building, and noted his most efficient assistant was his gifted wife, who in order to aid him acquired the technical knowledge of an expert and so carried out the plans which her disabled husband perfected. But nothing ever came of it, and in 1915 it was officially named the Brooklyn Bridge. The Roebling Bridge is now the bridge that was built in Cincinnati, and it's named after my father-in-law. Well, I started taking an interest, uh, after all these years spending uh, so much time in, a, in the men's world, I started taking an interest in the women's world as well. And I ran for the president of the Daughters of the, of the American Revolution, the national president, but had to pull out because my health was failing. And um, it, it made me very upset I, to have to give up my uh, activities that I loved. I, I wrote, I seem like a ship at sea without a rudder or compass. And I died on February 28th, 1903. I was just 59 and a half years old. My obituary appeared in over 50 newspapers around the country and even across the world. I was called one of the most noted women in the country and the most famous woman in New Jersey. And um, I, it appeared in t uh, the Electrical uh, Review and the Engineering News, two technical papers in New York. I was probably the first woman to appear on those pages. But I find the most, oh, and it appeared in a paper in Mexico City and one in Germany. Germany's not so surprising given the family, the, the uh, Mexico City a little bit. But the one I found the most amusing, if you can call an obituary amusing, is the one that appeared in the Troy Times, which calls me a typical woman of today. And uh, said that Mrs. Roebling made herself famous as the practical representative of her invalid husband in the building of that master work of science, the East River Bridge. And it says, it is in this revelation of the fact, once so sternly denied, that women can be effective in great projects without ceasing to be women, that Mrs. Roebling becomes typical. As for my husband, he soon remarried and lived happily ever after, apparently, with his second wife. And in the 1920s, as an 80-something-year-old man, he, uh, he ran the Roebling Wire Factory after our designated heir died on the Titanic. And he died peacefully in 1926 at the age of 89, at which point our beautiful, beautiful mansion in Trenton was offered to the New Jersey governor, government as the governor's mansion. Um, but they rejected it. They said maintenance would be too expensive. And it fell into disrepair. It was finally demolished and in 1946. Uh, became a parking lot for a couple of decades, and then in 1965 became the site of the New Jersey State Library. But our bridge, our beautiful bridge, has lived on. By 1903, it was carrying over half a million people each day, and uh, soon three more bridges would be added to help carry the load. In 1933, on its 50th anniversary, the New York Times ran an editorial saying that it would seem fitting that Mrs. Roebling's uh, work be commemorated in, on this anniversary, but nothing came of that. It would be another 20 years when the uh, Brooklyn Engineering Association would install that plaque that uh, I opened this presentation with which says, the builders of the bridge dedicated to the memory of Emily Warren Roebling, whose faith and courage helped her stricken husband, Colonel Washington A. Roebling, CE, civil engineer, complete the construction of this bridge from the plans of his father, John A. Roebling, CE, who gave his life to the bridge back of every great work 
we can find the self-sacrificing devotion of a woman, which is rather gratifying. And there's some of our um, great uh, grand, my great grandson delivering that, uh, oh, you know, drawing the curtain. In 1964, the Brooklyn Bridge was declared a National Historic Landmark, and on the centennial in 1983, my role was highlighted in a television documentary. It was one of the first ones that were done by Ken Burns, a museum exhibit, a sound and light show, and a musical, and the National Women's Hall of Fame and City Corps created an Emily Award to recognize a woman of note in engineering uh, or construction. And in 1998, I was inducted into the Rensselaer Polytechnic Alum Institute Alumni Hall of Fame with my husband, Washington, uh, as joint uh, honorees. The bridge itself has lived in popular uh, imagination. Uh, David McCullough claims that it's been the subject of more paintings, photographs, and other artwork than any other man-made structure in America. I don't know how you count that, but uh, certainly many, many, many people have tried to uh, create their versions of the bridge in art. It's also been a cultural and advertising icon. You can see this wonderful uh, advertisement from from the time for, for boots, uh, the boot bridge, I like to call it. Um, there's also a textile from 1939 World's Fair, uh, including the bridge. Empire Sewing Machine is getting into the act, and there's a 1900 Rosh Hashanah card that uh, shows it as well. On the grand opening, the day of the grand opening, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle ran the headline, United. And in the article, it stated, great Amer emergencies are the opportunities of great minds. Mrs. Emily Roebling met this difficulty as nobody else could. Day after day, when she could be spared from the sick room in cold and in wet, the devoted wife exchanged the duties of chief nurse for those of chief engineer of the bridge, explaining naughty points, examining results for herself, and thus she established the most perfect means of communication between the structure and its author. How well she discharged the self-imposed duty, the grand and beautiful causeway best tells and once we're able to travel again you might consider going up to cold spring and nearby is a bed and breakfast called the bird and bottle inn which is said to be haunted by me you can decide if that's true or not it's very close to the shakespeare festival as well that's up there um, closer to home if you go to uh, near trenton uh, just uh, about 15 minutes north is the Roebling Wireworks. It relocated out of Trenton in the early 1900s. Uh, and uh, then after uh, U.S. Steel collapsed in the 1970s, it went out of business. And in around 2000, uh, a group of, of citizens created a museum there, a beautiful small museum there. So uh, I recommend it highly. It, it also works very well if you want to see the grounds for sculpture on the scene because they're very close together. You can also take, of course, a virtual field trip by uh, going to uh, reading more about it. I have an annotated bibliography at bridgebuilderinpetticoats.com, which you can see here. And uh, there's a uh, there was a thesis uh, written by Marilyn Weigold that calls me a silent builder. And I appear in David McCullough's uh, classic book, The Great Bridge, as well as a chapter with my husband in his book, Brave Companions. There's also Richard Haw has a beautiful coffee table book called The Art of the Brooklyn Bridge, which tells the history of it as well, but just beautiful, beautiful images. And I also call to your attention Clifford Zink's The Roebling Legacy, which is a wonderful historical study of that. Uh, I am discussed in uh, these other books, uh, More Than Petticoats, Remarkable New York Women. I think New York and New Jersey kind of arm wrestle for me because I lived in both places. Engineering Legends, I'm one of four women who appear in that book. Um, and there uh, recently have been written two children's books on my role in the bridge, Secret Engineer and How Emily Saved the Bridge. Finally, I just want to uh, tell you one fun story about uh, the interesting things we uncover when we are doing historical research. In 1921, my husband wrote a letter to a uh, to a reporter who was asking if he had ever met uh, Lincoln, and he said yes, as a matter of fact, on two occasions. The first was uh, in May 1861 as a new uh, 
soldier. Uh, he saw Lincoln speaking from the rear portico of the White House. And secondly, about April 1st, 1864, when he came down to Culpeper County to review the army previous to the Battle of the Wilderness, I was at that time major and aide-de-camp to General Warren, commanding the 5th Corps, and joined in the cavalcade. The president was mounted on a hard-mouthed, fractious horse and was evidently not a skilled horseman. Soon after the march began, his stovepipe hat fell off. Next, his pantaloons, which were not fastened on the bottom, slipped up to the knees, showing his white homemade drawers secured below with some strings of white tape, which presently slipped up also, revealing a long, hairy leg. While we were inclined to smile, we were at the same time very much chagrined to see our poor president compelled to endure such unmerited and humiliating torture. After repairs were made, the review continued but was shortened on his account. I never saw him again and was in Covington, Kentucky when I heard of his assassination. Now, what's so interesting about this wardrobe malfunction is that nobody else ever reported it. And uh, I, when I checked in with the Lincoln Library in Illinois, they'd never heard of it either, which makes me think that Colonel Washington Roebling may have made this up to pull the leg of the reporter. Because if you notice the date, it's April 1st. In any event, oops. the next here we go here we go in any event i have one more treat for you and that is that you are taking a ride on the train crossing the bridge in 1899 you can see it right here and uh, i think it must be a weekday because it's mostly businessmen crossing the bridge on weekends particularly on sunday apparently the bridge in those days was often used for a gentleman and lady friend to take a walk along it became quite a tourist attraction in in town but there you are getting a chance to ride and finally i just want to point out i do have a half a dozen other programs Three are on women in political history, uh, Remembering the Ladies, which goes along with a book that I've written about uh, American women uh, in politics, from patriots in petticoats to presidential candidates, uh, Pickets and Persistence, War Service and Women's Suffrage, How Women Won the Vote, and Reclaiming Our Voice, New Jersey's Role in that Struggle. I also have... Um, three other programs, two on women in aviation, one on the early aviators who preceded Amelia Earhart, Nobody Owns the Sky, these stories were lost because she disappeared, and one on the women Air Force service pilots of World War II called A Wasp Takes Wing. Uh, and finally, I have a program on uh, Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts, also known as Crazy Daisy. If you're wondering about John A. Roebling Bridge, Bridges only three still survive. There's the aqueduct, the that Delaware aqueduct that was built in 1849 and has it was restored in 2011. This is what it, it's looked like over the years. And uh, there's of course the Cincinnati Covington Bridge, known as the Roebling Bridge, and the Brooklyn Bridge. And you're saying, but we have a bridge right in our neighborhood, the Rigelsville Bridge. Uh, and it is a Roebling Bridge, but not a John A. Roebling Bridge. It was built by the Roebling Company a year after I died. Um, in fact, a few months after I died, there was something called the Pumpkin Flood in October of 1903, which knocked down the previous span. And just six months later, this bridge was uh, was installed. And it's uh, just under 600 feet uh, long and has uh, two and five eighths inch cables holding it up and cost the princely sum of $30,000 to erect. So uh, I thank you so much for having you having me here today. And uh, if you have any questions, I am uh, would be de absolutely delighted to answer them. So we'll go back to a full screen view, I think, and uh, see if it, anybody wants to unmute themselves and uh, and then we can do this. Let me see. I think I need to, uh, oh, I had one more thing to do. I forgot about this. Let me, if I'm still here, remember how I told you that wind is the, uh, the enemy of 
um, the the wind is the enemy of of uh, bridges. This is an incredible video of the the bridge, the collapse of the Tacoma Bridge, which happened 40 years Tacoma in 1940. Bridge, Washington, opened only a few months ago, was built at a cost of over six million dollars. But misfortune overtakes the great structure. These are some of the most amazing pictures ever recorded by a newsreel. The actual collapse of the world's third largest suspension bridge. Only a 35 mile an hour wind is blowing, but this apparently sets up a rhythmic swinging of the bridge, which increases with each swing. Finally, the swinging road and the suspension cables give way and plunge into the water below. So, thankfully, he got off, as did the dog. Nobody died in that, but it's quite amazing and astonishing, and rather shocking. So let me see, I think I can, yes, I will stop my screen share at this point, and you can uh, ask me questions if you have any. People can um, unmute themselves, people can uh, start their videos. Let's see, we have some stuff in chat. Let's see if anything, there we go. Okay. Oh, the Regal still bridge, yes, just, uh, and... Okay, I'm glad people are liking it. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything that I've shared with you? Any questions at all? Oh. <laughs> if any of you have children and want to do like a bridge building event at some point at your um, in your house uh, with straws or um, toothpicks and marshmallows or whatever. I've got a lot of plans on my website and if you go to tellingherstories.com hit on hit bridge builder and petticoats and you look for those things you'll find that as well. I also have as I said the um, the link to the bibliography there okay. if you want to read more about it. The uh, Tacoma Bridge, was that Tacoma, Washington? It is, yeah it was. It was yeah it was new. 1940 you would have thought they had a lot more bridge building knowledge than we had, you know, in 1870s, but, um, but there was a literally, well, fatal, but fortunately only for the structure and not for human beings, a uh, flaw. And it, 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 uh, the wind apparently caught it just the wrong way and it started to, uh, get that torque, which is something that Washington, uh, sorry, that John A. Roebling, my father-in-law, always was talking about, was that uh, one of the reasons you needed both the diagonal and the vertical stays was to, and you also needed uh, the weight. Uh, uh, it's far more complicated than I'm going to talk about here, but um, structurally, that is what something you have to really worry about is, is, um, is wind catching a bridge and starting up these these uh, rhythms that then take it out and so one question carol uh what yeah. was john a's cause of death someone is asking uh tetanus oh tetanus oh, yeah. lockjaw yeah mm -hmm. and the big question is whether um his peculiar notion of medicine he rejected conventional medicine and only had what was called the water cure ice cold water poured on his foot for you know 24 7. but whether that people say well he didn't get conventional medicine well i don't they didn't have uh, tetanus shots in those days you know so even if he'd had conventional medicine he probably wouldn't have survived but yeah he did have a peculiar notion of, of medicine um, Anyone but, yeah, so he died that way. The bigger mystery is what made Washington sick. And um, whether it was indeed caisson disease, whether the caisson disease triggered basically a nervous breakdown, uh, whether the medicine that he was given, apparently in one newspaper article, the 
uh, reporter mentions that you know there are dozens of pill boxes on his side, and in those days, a lot of what people were being given were opioids. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's really hard to know, and nobody's exhumed the bones if there are anything there, but they really don't know. But it is a real mystery how he was so sick for basically the duration of the project, but then lives to be 89 years old. <laughs> you know, outlived me, who's, you know, Emily is over a decade younger mm -hmm. and uh, then dies two decades, two and a half decades. Mm -hmm. Um, before he does. Uh, any other questions? Anybody before we let Carol go for the night? Okay. Thank you so much. Carol. Well, thank you so much. It really was a pleasure. I hope to come back as somebody else. Um, my husband calls me Sybil. Who are you going to be today? <laughs> and uh, I do have a lot of other programs, not any for a couple months now, uh, Jan uh, December and January are light, but starting again in February, you'll start seeing, uh, and it's possible some will get scheduled now, but I, I doubt it, but, uh, and, and definitely in March for Women's History Month. And in this era right now, as you know, some of you may be coming from wherever. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Zoom enables you to go across the country as easily as across town. So, uh, in fact, before we started here, I, uh, before my program started, I was I was talking uh, with Janet about the fact that I've been attending some programs out of Ohio, uh, and uh, through the National First Ladies Library. And today they had a program that was coming from uh, Louisa May Alcott, coming from Massachusetts. So you know, doesn't matter where you are. So uh, absolutely, and I have links to programs from around the country on women's history and women's suffrage. If you go to my website, tellingherstories.com, you'll find a whole bunch of links there, too. Yep. One more question, Carol. Uh, did yeah. they ever discover what caisson disease was? What? Oh, I, I guess I must have missed it. It was. The, it's what we call the bends. It's dissolved wow. nitrogen. Hmm. And at the time, it was uh, not understood. Uh, they brought in doctors who said, oh, you know, come up and down more often or whatever. Don't stay down so long which is partly don't stay down so long, but coming up and down doesn't help. You know, it's, it's how far you need to be coming up slowly, uh, depending on how long you've been down and how deep you've been down. And they didn't understand that for another couple of decades. Wow. So, uh, yeah, everybody, it was, it was long after the bridge. But it did govern several, several decisions, including that the bridge is not on bedrock on the New York side. It's on bedrock in Brooklyn, but uh, when they got down to about 80, a little over 80 feet uh, on the New York side, they were having so many people get getting sick, and they were having such slow going, because even though it wasn't bedrock, it was really, really hard, that um, that Washington had some, you know, ordered that they do some, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, bear, uh, you know, corings taking some cores, and they looked and they found that it was petrified sand. And they thought, you know, this may be strong enough. If we keep try to do another 40 or 50 feet to get to bedrock on this side, we are going to lose so many more men. Mm -hmm. So he made a very, very difficult decision, which fortunately has held, that uh, that ch sand hadn't shifted in 3 million years and probably would be good for the duration of the bridge. But, yeah. And if anyone needs... Uh to contact Carol or um, her um, website address or email address, just um, just email me. Yeah, um, it, actually, it's just telling her stories plural dot com. So like telling histories, but change his to her. Um, so it's easy, easy to remember and spell. And at my website, there's information on how to contact me. Great. All right. Thanks. So and, much, yes. Carol. If you if something occurs to you afterwards, by all means, please, please get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to answer you. Very interesting. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Janet, for inviting me and we taking care of the logistics. And uh, thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.
Well, Janet, thank you. That worked really great. Sorry, I had to start it over again, but I just thought I kept losing my train of thought there. It would be better if I just yeah. came and, from the uh, beginning. And and this was actually it was better because now I can remain as host. I can uh, forward the host and then uh, take it back so that I can admit people and also mute if we need to. So um, it's yeah. cool. Yeah, we, we learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Splendid. And I'll be send, uh, sending you the recording soon. That's great. Um, I usually, I, it, you can send it any way you want, but I usually use wetransfer.com because it can transfer big files easily. Okay. All right. Uh, it's, it's free and you just attach it. Free. And it lasts. It lasts. It's free, which is good. Um, good. That, that fits in our budget, Carol. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's it's very handy. I've now used it. I, it was a library that told me about it a year or two ago, um, because they wanted to have a copy of my slides in case something came up. And or I think yeah, because they had no tech services and they needed to mount it on a on one of their computers. Okay. which was attached to their, you know, usually I brought my own computer and stuff, but they wanted it all there. So they wanted my PowerPoint, and that was too big to just attach to an email. Mm -hmm. And so they mentioned WeTransfer, and I've been using it ever since. What happens, the free version, it expires after a week, so you have to download it at the other end. So they're not holding it on their servers permanently. But that works fine, because you've got it at your original end, and you send it, you know, it's, it's going through the mail, through the email, uh, through the WeTransfer internet, and then it's back, you know, you get it to your place, and then you can do whatever you want at the other end, but uh, yeah, and they have a few advertisements, but I can live with that for free. That's okay. Yeah. Well, we can live yeah. with that. Thanks for the recommendation. <laughs> You're welcome, Janet, and uh, have a good holiday season, and I uh, hope to see you again sometime. Great. Me too. And yeah, if you guys are doing any, oh, you were going to send me a link to um, where you posted some uh, that program on Alice Paul at some point, right? Oh, yes, yes, um, I'll do that, yes. And if uh, if you have any other, I love, uh, if if I can get on your ma emailing list or whatever for notifications of events, I'm. I, you know what? I will send you a link to to get on uh, notifications. Okay. For me. That's perfect. Super. All right. All right. Take care. Bye now. Bye.